everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, back with another one of these. You all liked the last Twitter thread so much, so I figured it's pretty low effort content for me. Good luck, Dyer. I might as well do another one. Today we're going to be talking not about cards that were vastly underrated, but cards, decks, and strategies that were vastly overrated. It turns out, and I know this is going to shock you, that a lot of the people who review cards for a living, people like me, occasionally miss the mark. I know. I know. Unthinkable. But in fact, many of us got a lot of stuff wrong, and it's not just us, uh, not only Yugi tubers, but also the wire player base, the large player communities like Zodiac Duelist, and even some pro players have made mistakes, valuing many cards way higher than they should be. This is going to be a list of some of the best of the best of the worst, the cards that were expected to shake the metagame to its core and then failed to do so. Now, notably, these cards aren't necessarily bad. A lot of these cards are extremely good, in fact, but they were expected to usher in a new tier zero deck or strategy and only ended up being all right. So let's see what people have come up with. I'll begin with this card, Magical Musketeer Caspar. On release, individuals like Lithium2300 were calling the Magical Musketeers the next Zodiacs, the most dominant deck of all time, reintroduced in the form of these monsters. And it turns out that is not at all what happened. These cards were middling at best, and even with a card that summons five monsters from deck in Magical Musketeer Max, they failed to make any sort of noticeable metagame splash. Now, Rebby is known for her good takes, so I'm sure these are going to be right. Ogdoatic. Even with a Snake Rain reprint hinted at via promo copy text, people went by a wild plus hype. It saw three local tops with Invoked and Orcist, and then everyone realized it sucks. That's true. Every Ogdoatic card reads like it's going to be the next big thing. But a lack of Reptile finishers means that it's at best a splash in better decks like Dragonlink. And right on cue, here are people coping about it in the context or in the comments. Ogdoatic is a deck that will be sleeper good for a decade. This card got overhyped as if it was the second coming of Christ, only to be put in an okay synchro deck. Yeah, Naturia Pineapple on release was expected to be game warpingly strong. I think this card is part of maybe one topping list ever. Um, it was fine, and it's not hard to see why people expected it to be decent. Uh, you can special summon it from the graveyard, so it's like really good tribute fodder, but in reality, the deck that it enabled wasn't particularly good, and its utility in that deck wasn't really accomplished by anything the deck wasn't doing anyway. Oh my god. Golden Apples, one of the biggest misses of all time, a card so unbelievably hyped that it was played in Duel Links, I think only because of memory. Uh, Gores was still in deck lists, and the Golden Apples was being hyped as a way to recoup the loss of the damage you took and summon a big token. It's not hard to see why this card saw these super favorable comparisons to Gores, but in reality, it was garbage. $20 at pre-release. Oh, this one's particularly funny. Ancient Leaf draws you two cards if you have 9,000 or more life points. This card is not good, will never be good in anything but what, Aeromage, but... In like 2015, a leaked version of Master Rule 5 made it to the masses, and it claimed, among other things, that life points would start at 10,000. Why people thought they would start life points at 10,000 and not ban Pot of Greed is beyond me, but this card got bought out overnight and became like a $5 common, despite the fact that the entire post was made up. Red Eyes Dark Dragoon. Mask, you're going to get a lot of people telling you you're wrong about this, but you are absolutely correct. Red Eyes Dark Dragoon occupied a very specific section of best thing you could summon with Verte Anaconda at a very specific point in history. It could have been any monster that protected itself or did a negate and accomplished the exact same thing. But I think now we can all recognize this card is mid at best. Let's not forget the weekend when a group of Yugi tubers tricked the world into buying out this card. Okay, so Gizmekuka is not a particularly powerful card. This is a hand trap that allows you to summon from your deck a monster with the same attribute as a face-up monster your opponent controls that has an attack that equals its defense. At the time, it was being used to target Kristron Halka Fibrax to summon Barrier Statue of the Torrent. Uh, this is not a good idea. The concept was it's basically like um, Psyframe Gear Gamma in that you're playing one Garnet for this engine, uh, but in reality, it was super inconsistent and only had applications versus that line specifically. When Scrap Raptor was revealed and Twitter thought Orcist was back because it was a recycler searcher, Scrap Raptor was supposed to break Dinosaur, Orcist, and in reality broke 
My wallet for trying to buy a scrap Chimera and nothing else. Awful card. I know that a lot of people are going to look at this and be like, this is a tier one, tier two deck that you're talking about. What do you mean this is an overhyped card? Well, you have to understand the bar that people set for Flunder. Uh, when Fluanderese was first revealed, uh, people were all over YouTube talking about how it was going to usher in a tier zero meta in which this was the only playable strategy. Yasin actually said they need to invent a tier above tier zero to explain how dominant this strategy is going to be. And the first time that it came out, the first wave of support, we got literally zero tops. I think maybe it cleared once at a remote dual YCS and then immediately lost. That said, the deck is now quite good because they've gotten a second piece of support and there's a metagame that is just generally more favorable for this strategy. Um, even then, the deck is nowhere near as dominant as Doomsayers on YouTube pretended it would be at its original release. For the last three years, every time a new ban list gets dropped or any tangentially related support card is announced, people say PK is going to be tier zero, and every time, it's okay. That's true. That is absolutely correct. I am usually one of those people. It boggles my mind that every format, PK is only fine. Like, this new format is uh, dominated by decks that make the Scythe Lock with DPE. You'd expect the deck that is the best at that to be Phantom Knight, right? But it turns out that 15 other strategies are just as good as this one. And uh, as a result, I think Phantom Knight is wavering somewhere between tier 2, 3, and unplayable. We all know the story. The last bastion against Zodiac that, uh, did not stand. O-D-D -D Lamia. O-D-D -D Lamia. Well, yes, uh, this card was released about a week before Zodiac came out. People expected DDD to be tier zero. So big were the brains of their pilots, and in reality, it folded to absolutely everything. Dryden Pass was enough. A single hand trap was enough. They had none of the really powerful cards uh, that they expected they would have. It was released super late into the archetype's lifespan. There is an argument that what doomed this archetype to obsolescence was not actually the fact that the cards were not powerful, it's that they were released and delayed for so long that by the time they were released, there was better stuff available. But in reality, this singular card that was expected to break the archetype wide open did not do so. And to this day, DD Lamia remains a one of in a deck full of much better cards. Oh, no, yeah, yes, this is a really good one. Armed Dragon Flash, a quick play spell card that can summon a level 3 Armed Dragon from your deck and defense position. This came out at a time when Dragon Link was incredibly dominant, and one of the cards responsible for their dominance was Quick Launch, which summons a dragon from your deck. People looked at Armed Dragon Flash, expected it to be Quick Launch's copies 4, 5, and 6, and failed to realize that there is a world of difference between Rocket Tracer and Armed Dragon level 3. <laughs> If you thought Lair of Darkness was going to shake up the metagame, you were an absolute rube. I have a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. I, I don't know how much more wrong you could be. I mean, I, I know this is just here to frustrate me specifically, but sure, I'll take the bait. Neos Alias is the opposite of this. It was not particularly hyped. It ended up being playable for six years with and without Stratos. Remember when this was an $80 card? I remember when this was a $115 card because that's when I purchased it. This garbage, oh my god, plus one normal summon. Ah, this is contentious for sure. Card Cardi has seen a lot of play over the years in a ton of different strategies, but pretty much everyone who has ever played the card will probably tell you it's not as good as it reads on paper. Uh, despite the fact that it was common knowledge this card was worth playing, I don't think anyone was particularly happy to do so. It counts if Konami was the ones hyping it, right? Didn't they call this the most anticipated card of 2017? Yeah, there are some old Konami blogs in which they claim that they are about to release the best monster of 2017. A year in which the Zodiacs came out and Sea Monster of Theseus was what they thought was going to break the game forever. A normal monster that happens to be a tuner you can instant fusion into. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's been good a couple of times, but nowhere near the title of best monster. I'm gonna reserve judgment on Book of Lunar Eclipse. I think that people were excited for it to potentially be playable, and I still think there are scenarios in which this card is going to be fine. Don't know if Red Eyes were ever hyped. <laughs> no. Did you know people topped playing this card? It does literally nothing. This doesn't need an explanation. Oh, no, don't worry. They're gonna be playable this time. 
No, we've given Noble Knights everything they need. They're going to be playable this time. No, don't worry. We've given them everything they need. They have to be playable this time. No, come on. They're going to be playable this time. I mean, look at the new cards. Look at they, they got everything they need. They're going to be playable this time. Thanks, Infra Noble Knights, for understanding the only way to make this archetype playable was just to release a whole bunch of monsters that aren't Noble Knights. Gearsu the Orcist Mech Knight. Oh, no. Do you think this is... This definitely qualifies. Yeah. So, Gearsu the Orcist Mech Knight, if you're unfamiliar, bins an Orcist from your deck, then summons an additional token to your side of the field. It was not only the starter that Orcist absolutely needed to be meta, it was also a powerful combo piece in all manner of different strategies. It competes for the normal with stuff like uh, Alistair the Invoker, uh, because it had a line that got it to a nine-star monster, uh, worked with Generator to make VFD. I mean, there was just so much this did. And it was legitimately played in zero-tiered decks after it was released. This card commanded an $80 price tag at one point, despite seeing zero represented tiered play. Unbelievable. Uh, that said, if they ever bring Harp Horror off the ban list, this card is going to be insane. During Toss format, this was a staple for some reason, even though it was barely summoned, hardly used, and immediately discarded once better boss monsters came out. This card is still $85, even though it sees zero play anywhere. That is 100% correct. Blackluster Soldier, Soldier of Chaos, one of the most expensive cards that ever lurked in extra decks, despite being summoned like four times total in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. The idea is, if you attack in with it, there's some decks that don't have an out to this card. Those decks are few and far between, and also probably do have an out to this card. You know, you'd make it versus Eldlich and be like, haha, I finally did it, just for them to make Liba and walk over it. Miserable, miserable. Oh, wow. Now this is a really contentious one, for sure. Uh, Evil Swarm was putting up results during one of Konami's historically least diverse formats of all time against one of the historically most powerful Yu-Gi-Oh decks of all time in Dragon Ruler. And on paper, it makes a lot of sense. Evil Swarm Ophion is a high attack monster that prevents your opponent from summoning level five or higher monsters. That means that Dragon Ruler players who are trying to build a board aren't going to be able to do so in the wake of this card. But that's about as far as the strategy gets. In reality, this was a rescue rabbit strategy, and as a result, uh, played a ton of normal monsters. Those normal monsters meant the deck was bricky and inconsistent. It had a much lower ceiling than the other two top decks, um, Prophecy and Dragon Ruler. And unfortunately, being an anti-meta deck, when your opponent could be playing one of two other decks, one of which you have almost no game against in Prophecy, is not a great place to be. Add to that the fact that Dragon Rulers had an out for this card. Evil Swarm Ophion searched Infestation Pandemic that could prevent it from being destroyed by spell trap cards, but not monster effects like Blaster. In reality, I think what made Evil Swarm so popular was its low price point, which meant that so many people were playing it, even at events where it probably shouldn't be topping, it would maybe put up one or two showings. From the people who play this format historically, uh, because Dragon Ruler Mirrors are very skill intensive, there is like a pretty small uh, Dragon Ruler format community, they have started to assemble around an increasing consensus that this deck is dog water and should not be included in like historic understandings of the format because it just can't hold a candle to the other two titans in prophecy and dragon ruler vw players were heavily coping on this one stellar wind wolf riot i almost made that a video wrong. about talking about how it wasn't good but i didn't want to be so unbelievably wrong so i never made it i don't know if this is either due to lore or because of its super poly effect but no one's playing this guy Oh shit, they literally do not know. <laughs> ah, let's just bookmark this one and come back to it in about a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Farfa. This is true. It is kind of crazy, right? Like, Regeki Break in a format that includes Masterpiece? Yeah, right. What good is your Dryden going to be against a monster unaffected Masterpiece? Chad, if you're taking this one seriously, I, I'm sorry. You... <laughs> You're a dummy. <laughs> this tweet is from the future. Mill is still bad. People are still freaking out about it anyway. Sophie, I'm going to be honest with you. You are absolutely correct. Mistrune is terrible. I'm putting together the 10 minute testing of it, which is going up tonight. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that without additional uh, waves of support, this is not going to be a good strategy. I that was wrong. <laughs> good timing.